Right. I guess uh, we can get started. And uh, good morning for those uh, living in North America and uh, for good night and good day, depends on where you are. Probably some of you are so dedicated. It's at 3 a.m. In, in the morning. Uh, kudos to you. Uh, that, that happened before. But uh, thank you very much. I think everyone dialed in today, uh, partially because of us, I hope, partially maybe because of IACR. IACR just finished yesterday, literally within uh, 24 hours. And we are here to uh, bring the people, the experts, uh, and also the people who went to IACR in person, not like me, I attended virtually, have to admit, my bad, to share their insights and the sentiment that they felt over there. Without further ado, let me start with a little bit quick introduction of uh, who we are. For those uh, who are just uh, dialing in the first time, I'm going to share my, share my screen real quick. Here we go. All right. Uh, so we call ourselves BioVerse webinar, and today we are going to do the ACR 2024 recap. Why? We are here today. Um, Bioverse actually is a monthly show co-produced by SAPA GP and the Insense We Trust community. SAPA GP is the largest ethnic Chinese focused pharmaceutical professional association in the world. And this uh, uh, this uh, webinar specifically uh, co-produced by SAPA GP Guifeli chapter. Insense We Trust community is a new nonprofit, and uh, we aim to bring Asians around the world together to share knowledge and help each other and also advance each other's uh, business. And our biggest uh, differentiation factor is we focused on C-level executives with the Asian ethnic background. So as of today, especially in China or like a Chinese founded biotech, we have uh, the majority of uh, those uh, China or Chinese funded biotech who have at least a one C level exactly in our community. All right, so let me get a quick introduction of the audience uh, to the audience of our speaker today. I could be really brief, and uh, because you can always look at their very impressive uh, bios from the website and also from our um, events flyer, you may receive from different locations. Uh, actually, what I would do a little bit different, I would just uh, let the speaker, each one of you, if you could, could limit it uh, to like one or two minutes, introduce yourself, and uh, that would be great. I'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Li Huayu. Uh, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Liang. Hi, this is Li Huayu. And as you can see, I'm currently Chief Data Officer for Life My Therapeutics. We, I just started this role about a month ago, but for a long time, starting with my career in AstraZeneca, I've always been in oncology, mostly using genomic data science to support precision oncology. Nice to meet you, everyone. So I know Casey is running late. He's uh, taking some uh, clinical meeting, and uh, I will just uh, skip him for now. Jeff, would you please a few words? Oh, actually, sorry, Casey. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, hi, everyone. <laughs> sorry okay. for that. Um, I just... Don't worry. Drove up from uh, San Diego to Los Angeles, and uh, it's about 6 a.m. here. But I'm very pleased to be on your panel. I uh, hope I can contribute some. Uh, I've uh, been interested in cell therapy. I've been doing research on it for about 25 years. Uh, initially, at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in the last 10 years at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where I'm a professor of medicine and Kenneth Miller professor um, of research. And... Um, my area of focus has been primarily in cell therapy, but also antigen discovery. I have some disclosures. I am um, scientific co-founder of Amatics US, um, and I'm on the advisory board of Obsidian, and recently founded a uh, um, an early stage TCRT therapy company called Mongoose Bio. Um, AACR was an exciting event, and um, thanks so much for inviting me, uh, Leon. Fantastic. Now, Jeff, your turn. Thanks, Leon. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'll be very brief. Uh, I lead the oncology practice uh, within uh, our unit within uh, Lumanity. I uh, have done so for, for many, many years, uh, and uh, I couldn't do it without my colleague, Viraj. Viraj, intro to you. Yeah. Oh, thanks, thanks, Jeff. Uh, and thanks, Leon, and the rest of the team. Uh, I'm a principal and oncology lead in the, in the Lumanity uh, uh, oncology practice, and I've been consulting for about 10 years, you know, for, for 
almost 97% of the time in oncology and, you know, happy to be part of this discussion and, uh, yeah, see what the ACR was all about. Fantastic, fantastic. So we have a really nice mix. I think uh, Jeff, Raj, and myself attended ACR virtually. And uh, Li Hua and Casey attended in person. That's a really good mix. You know, sometimes the distance, because you have a little bit, uh, you know, how to say, uh, um, judgment because of, in my case, I did receive a lot of uh, analyst reports and you know uh, news uh, news uh, in articles from the front line, and also you know Li Hua and the casing have a lot of uh, you know uh, impersonal interaction. With that being said, this is uh, today's agenda. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, of course, there's like a thousands of uh, abstract we could not cover all of them. We just select some of them as a uh, conversation starter. To cover the main thing, we have a same and the AECR this year. And today's uh, process is pretty much like this. We can start, go through those abstracts until around 10, 10 past 10, right? We're going to leave about 20 minutes to cover the abstract we couldn't include right here. People probably come up or something during the discussion. And after that, going to be Q&A. And this is just my personal, you know, biased judgment of those abstracts based on my personal, you know, knowledge that could be wrong. So it's definitely up to discussion. And uh, so if there's any change, I'm very happy to do that. Like I, you know, show here, I group those, uh, you know, abstract into four categories. The first one is a high light, low light, really means those uh, really change the market, move the market. The second one is ADC, which is really hot. We cannot, you know, the biggest elephant in the room. The third one, obviously, the audience, like I just discussed before we started, 80, 80 or 90% of ethnic Asian. A lot of them actually run a biotech a biopharma company in Asia. So it would be a miss if we don't highlight you guys. That's a, you know, and that means we don't respect you enough. And finally, the ACR different from ASCO. There's a lot of new stuff. So we want to say what's, uh, you know, uh, how to say under the water. What's this uh, un like undercurrent that like, gonna become some new drug, a new you know stand of care? Not right now, probably five or 10 years from now. That's why we covered the fourth bucket. With that being said, and no further ado, let's dive right into the first one. Highlight, low light. Okay, so this is how we're gonna do this. You know, uh, I'm gonna go through this real quick. Um, and uh, whoever you know have any idea, you know, comments, please throw in. And also, some we already pre decided some of abstract are going to be led by someone else, it depends on expertise. So, this one's um, so I'll go real quick. This is a kind of made a lot of headline uh, in AUCR, especially among like in the Asian biotech uh, executive, because this is a uh, uh, you know significant uh, PD1 uh, by specific antibody uh, clinical data in phase three with OS as endpoint. So this is uh, obviously, this is a G, uh, G, uh, GEJ. And this is, I, I believe is a type of a gastric, right? So uh, so uh, the real doctor, Cassim, please correct me if I say anything horribly wrong. <laughs> so they did that. And this OS as endpoint, as you can see, you know, the, the mechanism, whether this makes sense, or how does this compare to like PD-1, the CTFO, a combo of two monoclonal antibodies up to discussion. I don't think this is settled yet, but this is a first piece of, uh, you know, endpoint with OS as a data. So if you look at the clinical trial design, what they did is uh, for the frontline, late stage gastric um, uh, cancer, uh, they give the patient either chemo, uh, uh, which uh, based on the discussion, I, I believe it's a kind of up to date. Uh, and their bispecific antibody for only six cycles. I won't, really want to emphasize their protocol over there is a little bit different. And the placebo is going to be chemo first, uh, ke sorry, chemo only, also only six cycles. Afterwards, the tricky part is, uh, you know, they uh, control R, they don't receive the drug anymore. So they don't have any drug. While their experimental arm still receive the PDOA, uh, sorry, uh, PD-1 and CD4 um, a bispecific antibody. And then they just uh, look at the typical stuff, OS as a primary endpoint, then a bunch of other, and secondary. Now, if you look at data, my first uh, gut feeling is uh, looks pretty good. I still remember uh, some of those uh, pivotal data from, let's say, PD Nevo plus chemo or Pembro plus uh, chemo in gastric cancer. I think uh, their hazard ratio is uh, better. So in the ITT population there, they're like a hazard ratio, I believe somewhere written there is uh, 0.62. 
but uh, for the other two is about like a 0. Uh, uh, 0, 0. 0.80 or 0. 0.78. So like a barely meet the bar for the other two, but it looks like, so their data look numerically better. And if you break down based on PDO1 uh, uh, expression level, the CPS, which is similar, I believe, to the uh, Merck's uh, stuff, but I'm not sure whether they use the same assay. Looks like there are difference. Uh, of course, as people expected, if your CPS score is uh, greater than five, their has reached is better. In this case, is uh, 0 0.56. And then if you look at the uh, toxicity, it looks like comparable because we know for like PD-1 chemo combo, the toxicity is mainly driven by chemo, right? Like the grade three and above uh, uh, toxicity uh, contribution from PD-1 or, uh, or like, you know, immuno oncology acid typically is around like a 10 to 15%. So that's kind of in line. This is pretty much a high level of the data. I have one more slide, so now I'll open the discussion. Uh, Leon, I'm sorry, yeah. real quick. Can you put it in presenter mode? There have been some text messages requesting uh, presenters. Sure. Yeah, just, just uh, we can see the. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Let me actually uh, exit first. I okay. don't think you can see my screen the right way, right? Can you or no? Right. I think you need to swap. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, just give me one second. Let me do that. Uh, how about now? It's coming up. Waiting. Looks there great. I have, a, yep. I have a, a really wide screen. I. I so I want to make sure that I make sure on your screen look right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, now you can see it, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So we have a couple a couple points that that you know I think we can all we all probably add. Well, first of all is um, you know regardless of the China based study versus U.S. which you know, we we brought up before, um, others can amplify on. I think you know the first thing is of course you know. Zelox is not necessarily the, the alone is the relevant comparator, right? It would be Updevo and Chemo or uh, Updevo plus Yervoy, you know, would be most relevant. Um, and there, you know, I mean, of course, everyone would like to have a chemo-free regimen. That's that. That's the the big thing. Um, this is not showing that, of course, but um, it would be nice if, if they could move in that direction. Um, but I think what's most relevant, um, at least in the conceptually is is the activity in the less than 5% CPS, um, where it is comparable, at least, I think, to um, uh, Updevo plus uh, plus chemo. Um, it's, actually, it's, yeah, it's probably better, Jeff. Yeah, so or even better. better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, for me, I'm most excited about this, and I'll go back to you, Viraj, because, you know, it was about seven, eight years ago, we did a big survey of the entire bi-specific landscape for, uh, for Genentech. I can say that because it's been long enough. And, um, you know, it's taken so long. And I'm not talking about engagers. I'm talking about kind of true dual targeting IO type of agents, um, not even things that are localizing uh, by definition of the TME. And it's just taken so darn long to kind of get some clinical readouts on these bifunctionals. So, you know, it's nice to see that, you know, there is activity for this agent. And, you know, at least it's relevant, again, with the caveat about, you know, the China population versus U.S. Uh, in terms of the uh, the CPS less than five. So, Baraj? No, yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the CPS less than five is definitely a higher net need population. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, CPS less than five, you know, yes, there's a broader approval for Nevo plus chemo. But realistically, you know, when we speak to physicians and KOLs, they do say that, you know, they, 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 you know, many times they will not add the the Optivo to the chemo if there's, you know, C, uh, CPS negative or CPS less than five. So I, I think because I mean, if you look at the difference in their checkmate um, six four nine, I think the hazard ratio is 0.87 or 0.9 or something. So I mean, there's basically no difference between you know by adding the Optivo to the chemo and CPS less than five. But this definitely shows. Yes, it's trending. You know, it's I think 0.75 or 0.77, like Leon said. So it is not, you know, as clear as, you know, CPS, you know, greater than five, you know, have that 0. 0.55, whatever hazard ratio, but, but I still feel like, you know, this, this, uh, this is interesting. And like you said, Jeff, I mean, the, the fact that you can, you know, we're, we're able to add the CTLA-4 without adding significant toxicity, at least, you know, I mean, they, they have like some data that talks about overall grade three events being, you know, 65% versus 60% in, you know, the checkmate trial. But I think it's probably more important to see what the what the what the CTLA four is bringing, the type of grade threes, uh, you know, and I think that that potentially will require some additional kind of analyses to understand, you know, what the addition, you know, what the different grade threes are because of the, you know, yeah. because of the CTLA four addition. But I mean, I, I agree. I mean, it is definitely interesting, and if you can translate this to 
uh, you know, the US and European population through their trials. I think that'd be very interesting, yeah. especially if CPS less than five. Population. I just want to highlight it here. So I think uh, probably, I think that's the most important part. They only give the drug for six cycles. And here in the experimental arm, they still had the drug, but the placebo one, they had no drug, right? Now, if with that information, you say the curve right here. Yeah. I don't know what causes the separation. <laughs> that's why I don't know. Because the first, uh, you know, when they both have their drug, there, there, there's no separation. Right, but of course, you know, I don't know. It's too early for any tail effect, of course. But I mean, yeah, I think it's kind of hard to, to kind of parse that at, at this point. But you know, let's just say it's it's intriguing, could be meaningful. Uh, we have the caveats about yeah, yeah. Travis, you know, translating to the U.S. population, but you know. I don't know, does Li Hua or Castian, any any other thoughts from, from you? Yeah, just two thoughts. One is um, about the tail. Uh, that's overall survival. It's not progression-free survival. So yeah. it's possible that, you know, you really don't see the survival effects till um, a little bit later. So it's a little more delayed. And then the second point, which I'm sorry, <laughs> my eyes fail me sometimes. Yeah. But there was, um, in terms of treatment-related adverse effects, I guess, that's different from immune-related adverse effects. And I was curious to see if, you know, what that um, uh, toxicity was, you know, the the colitis and pneumonitis, maybe not so much in pneumonitis, but colitis and all the itises. I noticed that the ALT was elevated and also pyrexia in the treatment group, in the experimental group, I mean. Um, so I wonder if there were um, IRAE events that are not, um, displayed here. Uh, do you have any insight into that? What was there any additional information? No, Thanks. I didn't. I didn't recall. Okay. But uh, th this is a kind of a, you know the caveats is really uh, come from the uh, discussing. Uh, she's a ch I forgot her name. She's a chief of a gastric uh, cancer uh, services from Sloan Catering, and she pretty much highlighted the, the four major issues she had. I mean, the first one, Jeff already pointed out, the China owning patient, right? The gastric, you know, the, the, the cause of a disease is probably a little bit different between the uh, Chinese patient, and the, uh, you know, the ex-China patient That's number one. Number two, that's also, you know, the, my biggest issue as well is like, you know, the chemo was stopped in both arms after only like a six cycle. That's really make it uh, not very comparable to any, you know, historic data in the U.S. anymore. And uh, yeah, so, and also she mentioned that I couldn't find the evidence. I don't know whether the patient indeed in a placebo arm didn't receive any treatments after progression. I, you know, that's uh, for me, it's a little bit uh, uh, unbelievable. And the last one, I think she also want to say, you know, because we all know gastric cancer, you know, if you have a MM, a MSI high or DMMR, you can be very responsible to BD1, right? So whether what's a portion of those patients over there? Probably they are like, you know, the super responder, they just drive everything, but there's no data over there. Yeah. And of course, I just threw this two table over there. Everyone use a benchmark for the people who are not familiar with the data. Numerically, they do look better. That's so why I want to highlight, give this to them, the hazard ratio ITT for them is, a, you know, 0 0.62, right? And then compared to, you know, let's say checkmate uh, 649, that's a, we believe the best data, the hazard ratio, you know, not as good. And uh, neither they are uh, uh, like a keynote at uh, 59. But I think yeah. that they discussed, and she also mentioned that there's a lot of uh, trials um, ongoing. For example, she mentioned Pembro plus uh, Trastuzumab plus a chemo have a pretty good initial data. Actually, for me, I just threw this out there. I thought, oh, how about the uh, PD1 plus ADC? Because the Merck has both. <laughs> and yeah. Merck actually presented a model therapy yeah. data and uh, ACR this year is like, a, I, I would uh, be hard pressed that they are not thinking of a combined this tool since they're both yeah. in their pipeline. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that, I think, uh, CPI, ADC combos as we go along. One thing I do want to add, I want to emphasize back to what I said about, you know, it's not the real standard of care comparison here in the U.S. of just Xilox alone, which one of the um, attendees also commented on. So I think that is relevant here, right? And this is the kind of disconnect. And it's not just for this trial. Often we see this being done, uh, you know, in U.S. biotech, it doesn't matter where, uh, you know, kind of the trial uh, or even earlier with preclinical data uh, where the comparators are not clinically relevant, right? So the clinical relevance is having a CPI chemo combination or or even, you know, the dual uh, CPI, you know, a Vivo, Yervo. 
your boy. So just Zelox alone is, is not really a relevant comparator in terms of kind of the clinical meaning of this at the end of the day. So I think we've beaten this one. <laughs> Yeah, but I I think to be fair, when they started this, probably the standard of care in China is very different from the U.S. I mean, they couldn't really apply the same standard of care between the uh, you know between their two arm. I mean, make their trials and the control aren't the same as the U.S. So actually, Jeff, I have a general question for you. For the case like this, right? The, if the company try to do a trial in a country uh, whose uh, standard of care is different from the U.S., what should they do? If uh, they also cannot recruit patient, you know, obviously China Biotech always had difficulty to recruit patient in the U.S. What could they do so to generate data point. useful? Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I don't even think that's a question directed just to China Biotech, right? Because again, I, we've I've seen it time and again in biotech. I've even seen it for large pharma where um, there's kind of insufficient consideration. Now, sometimes you're constrained by what you can do. Um, but I, I have often found that, you know, there are situations where there's insufficient consideration of how the standard of care might change. And of course, you can't put in what might become a standard of care, but you can certainly aim high for your TPP and design the study with the anticipation that that comparator might not be the actual comparator in your study arm, but something else coming along and therefore you know, aiming higher. And this is often why, you know, you still much hype and then people getting punished because they're over promising what the drug will do. And, and, you know, it's gonna, and it may do that, but that may be irrelevant to the actual evolving standard of care. So I think it's a broader issue than just China biopharma uh, or biotech development. Listen, I, 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 I see you are thinking, what's your comments? You, you are treating dog and you are treating <laughs> practicing <laughs> physician. I'm sorry. I'm not thinking. I was, I'm was. i drinking my coffee. Uh, <laughs> okay. Not yeah. thinking, but drinking. <laughs> I I agree with everything that's that's been said. And, and I think it's also in the comments and it's been repeated a number of times in terms of, you know, what the um what the placebo standard of care arm has been and will be. And, and you know, I mean, at MD Anderson, it, it, we're a little more aggressive as well. And so... I, I don't um, um I think that caveat is 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 uh, well expressed here. I have no other comments actually. I'm still looking okay. for the toxicity data because to me okay. actually that is the most important. Yeah, issue. I couldn't find that even in their that presentation yeah. the uh, the immune related yeah. events, Kathy. And so Thank all right, yeah. all right. Next yeah. one. This uh, we have to probably have a little bit cadence. Uh, yeah, I think we do. <laughs> Oh, this one's yours. You guys really, really want to talk about this one. So, you know, it's yours, Jeff and uh, Kaysen, you both, and also Viraj. Yeah. Kaysen, do you want to go? Oh, I'll be honest with you. I have not reviewed this one. I was uh, looking for the pancreatic one. So, okay. Viraj, you want to start us on, on the head and neck here? Uh, you, you can start with this one, and Jeff, I can add to yours, because I'm also trying to see, find my comments that I've written on for this one. Don't remember this <laughs> on the top of my head, so... Uh, you, you want me to try to? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. start us off from then. Okay. Yeah. So what happens? Uh, this one pump Moderna stock six percent when the data was released. That's why I paid attention, and a lot of people wrote about it. And uh, as of today, they went back. <laughs> so it's a short-lived uh, uh, jump. Uh, the main thesis is because people think this MRA, I believe it's like, you know, uh, 4157, they made a lot of news, right? When they initially announced the data with the non small cell lung cancer. And this is uh, in head and neck, right? So all of a sudden the market is a bit bigger now. That's why people have this like knee jerk in uh, reaction. Okay, let's just uh, change our model, put another, I don't know, a couple billion dollars on top of it. Uh, why is it going down? I don't know. But, uh, you know, the initial data looks like uh, in line with the, what I recall with uh, their non small cell lung cancer. That's, uh, that's how much I know. I'm not a cancer vaccine expert. So hopefully that gave a little bit background why this abstract, which is just a poster. I think people didn't even know there's uh, something like this because uh, only 22 patients. That's kind of nothing for like American and Moderna, right? But uh, this will change the stock. You know, you're talking about a couple billion dollars. Move. Yeah, anyway. and I find it again, having attended virtual, I find it kind of really hard to get beyond kind of what's shown here in the small numbers. Um, you know, and I can't account for the stock increase other than it just continues to add to the uh, kind of the apparent luster or halo that uh, that this deal has and this program has uh, as a particularly as they expand it 
uh, into additional indications. So, um, uh, yeah, it might be a halo effect from the pancreatic trial, um, certainly. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm not sure how the neoepitopes were selected for this particular trial. I think what's just for those who don't already know, I mean, patients are HPV negative. I'm assuming this is they are negative, yeah. So they are yeah, HPV negative. Yeah, um, have a far larger tumor mutational burden than those who are HPV positive. Um, mm -hmm. uh, prognosis is um, is not yes. great, obviously. Um, uh, these patients, surprisingly, um, it's the same response rate whether HPV positive or HPV negative. Uh, uh, so obviously, in the met need population where the um, uh, epitope is not immediately apparent. So an ideal uh, patient population for this type of study. Uh, yeah. The cytoplot is, is, is promising. I mean, there's, you know, one or two major complete responses, it seems here, maybe three even. Yeah. So, right. so that definitely, in, I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, so I think there's lots of push for doing a chemo-free regimen in first-line head and neck, metastatic, you know, recurrent metastatic, head and neck cancer, because I think, you know, I mean, currently, of course, in the US and EU, let's say half are getting, you know, Ketruda only, half are getting Ketruda plus chemo, and, you know, it's not like non-small cell, where, you know, it's, oh, you know, PD-L1, and the 50%, you're getting, you know, Pembromono, it, it's it's more individual, so there's lots of parameters, of course, CPS score is one of them, but I think there's definitely a push to then replace or supplant the population that's currently getting Pembro plus chemo, but but, you know, of course, you know, I mean, with IO, IO combinations, the, you know, it's not, you know, of course, we haven't replaced Pembro yet. We've seen some data with, you know, a lot of other agents. I think Digit had some, CD47 had some others. But, I mean, so the, I think the idea is that for those patients who require this activity of, you know, anti-tumor activity to be quick as well. Because that's what the chemo is basically added because they have more aggressive disease or, you know, more symptomatic or, you know, the, the location is, is is you know, in the head and neck is, is kind of, you know, closer to things where you need to get that. So I, I think, uh, you know, the, the there is definitely interest and high unmet need in not just where currently Pembro is used, but, you know, then expanding the population into where Pembro chemo is used and getting something that can show that activity in, in those uh, aggressive uh, patients as well. So I, I don't know if this is probably going to do that because, again, this is, you know, but I mean, definitely something to, you know, consider because, you know, there's one thing about replacing Pembro eligible patients, but, you know, I think the overall overarching goal is to then, you know, make a chemo-free regimen in front line. Like, now that's like getting the, you know, the, the, the true star, which gave the highly effect of this abstract based on what we discussed, say what's really going on over there. So, so that's <laughs> how you set this up, Leon. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't plan that one. And then I just, uh, you know, improvise on the fly. So here you go. Jason, you want to take it up from here? Yeah, this is um, actually a follow-up or the more immunobiological data from um, the study that's previously been published uh, out of uh, Sloan Kettering and uh, the collaboration with Genentech and BioNTech. So um, this is uh, um, the um, uh, the RNA neoangin study for patients with, um, I, I'm looking between my slide and yours, but basically patients with uh, uh, metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer. And I'm going to one second blow up my slide because these slides are so small with so much detail. Basically, these were um, uh, up to 20 MHC class one and class two um, restricted neoantigens uh, identified by uh, tumor and normal uh, tumor versus normal DNA uh, exome analysis. Um, so the computational prediction and rank of neoantigens is a little bit opaque, but nevertheless. Um, uh, they selected 20 of the top neoantigens, um, and um, they were given as two mRNA decatopes and lipoplex nanoparticles. Uh, again, you know, <laughs> I apologize as a clinician trying to pronounce these words here. All the genes sevum, sevumaran, um was given in eight priming doses and then continued um, after atezo. Um, after atezo. The interesting thing here is that uh, Fulfurinox was given um, after the vaccination, and in spite of that, there was a fairly robust responses. I shouldn't say in spite. I mean, obviously, it has uh, immunogenic properties, and um, and I think that um, that's something that uh, is revealed in the uh, more careful analysis of the um, of the of the clonal type tracking, which is. Um, one very important thing that came out of this, and I'm only on the first slide here on the left-hand side, is, is basically that these mutations were 
were not oncogene driving mutations. They were K, they were not, even though, you know, many of these patients, most of these patients were KRAS mutant pancreatic cancer patients. Um, these were uh, neoantigens derived from passenger mutations. And I think um, this is a very, very important point and kind of got lost until the question period. Um, and I think what that says is just because you like to make a vaccine against an oncogene driver doesn't mean that nature has to do what you tell it. Um, and I was debating this with somebody actually on the drive up here. And basically, if what, why why is that the case? You know, the, it's so prevalent. Well, well, the reason I think it should be obvious, um, if you have one or two oncogene driving mutations, you are uh, pitting that against the 900 or 1,000 other passenger mutations, the chances that you get an immunogenic um, KRAS mutations is very, very low if you do this stochastically. Um, there's no reason to expect that just because an allergy driver, it needs to be immunogenic. And so that's an important point. And in spite of this being, um, you know, neoantigens against passenger um, uh, neoantigens, you can see the response, the, the progression for your survival um, in the upper right hand uh, corner is, is dramatically uh, increase when you stratify for response to these neoepitopes. And so I think the point being made here, and if you can make out the bottom left and bottom right hand slide is, is this, he tracked the clonotype expansion in these patients. Um, those which he says are vaccine induced and those which were pre-existing. And so in the patients that received um, the vaccine, the vaccine induced responses, a large part of them were derived from cells um, that were not previously uh, seen in the circulation, uh, uh, clone types or, or a T-cell pool, um, and those um, that had failed to respond um, were those um, that did not have vaccine less a T-cell clone type. And I think this is a very important point because where did these T-cells come from? Uh, it turns out um, not all of them are coming from a pre-existing PD-1 amplified pool of T-cell clone types. Um, this is a critical point because it suggests that um, you get a, a memory response. And in fact, the memory response in these vaccine-induced chronotypes was so robust um, that they, if you calculate their half-lives, they actually would survive longer than the patient survived. I mean, more than 10 years in, in some cases to detectable levels. Um, so I think that you know, not understanding entirely the adjuvant mechanism of lipoplex and, and what have you is given here. Um, this combination with the atezolizumab followed by the vaccine, followed by fulfirinox, um, actually led to long-standing long vaccine-induced clonotypic T-cell responses. Um, so so the, only, the only thing that, you know, I wanted to um, emphasize here is that this data is, is is exactly what needs to be done. And I'm um, sorry, a little bit self-serving, but but in 2017, we published data with the Doppler transfer T-cell clones where we tracked the clone type as well. And the half-life, I think for the first time, demonstrated the half-life of transfer T-cell clonotypes correlated with the clinical response. And to see this happen in a vaccine-induced product is very rewarding and promising. However, the caveat is still, and, and I don't know how these were selected or validated, is that are these truly processed and presented? And I'm certain a fraction of them are processed and presented. I'd like to see that data. Vinod is a great guy. Um, you know, uh, I think former Damon Runyon Cancer Research, um, OOD, um, very bright. I'm sure they did the study somewhere, but I'd like to see whether these neoepitopes um, are actually processed and presented and in fact, truly melogenic, even in some in vitro setting. No question, the correlation is very, very strong. Um, for this, uh, and um, certainly, I hope people apply the same amount of rigor in the analysis as they do uh, to future trials of neoangiogenesis specific in immune therapy and vaccine based therapies. Kassin, I'm just curious to ask you a question since you opened this issue about kind of, uh, you know, the nature of the, the neoangiogens given the current predictive software, et cetera. Curious about your thoughts about some of those groups that have published on so called kind of negative or repressive uh, neoangiogens. Yeah. So um, I, I, I'm still very curious about that. I mean, obviously, um, I make sure this is public knowledge. I think Genocia, that was sort of their, you know. That was their thing, uh, yeah. And um, 
And now that they've been, I, I don't know all the business deal, they've absorbed by another company and, you know, there are so, so-called so terrorizing epitopes. Are those basically, as one might guess, generating um, CD4 regulatory type responses? And, and um, if you believe the work from Mark Davis not too long ago, suggesting there are in fact CD8 suppressor cells, so um, it's entirely conceivable that um, there are such animals present. Now, proving that is, I still think, a difficult task. Proving that it has a clinical negative effect is even more difficult. I I don't, you know, maybe a little bit of hubris is I don't pretend to to say, you know, this is a bad epitope and this is a good epitope. The only good epitope is one that's processed, presented, and immunogenic, period. That's it, you know. Um, so I, I think there's a lot to be said here because there's a CDA T cell responses, not that CD4 responses aren't aren't important as well. And certainly I hope that they looked at it more closely as well. But but I think that this is a this is a very, very nice study. And as you can see that the the advances beyond this you know, say a number of different things. And for us to say, hey, this is a bad new epitope because it may induce a tolerogenic response, maybe a little bit far for me to to completely commit to. Yeah, thanks. All right, so any more comments before move on? I think this is a tool really, really uh, thoroughly discussed. Okay, let's move on. So this one, uh, I would like to do like a basic fact there. I will let Jeff like uh, give us uh, what lesson we can learn from this one. <laughs> so this was uh, probably one of the low light or the lowest light of, uh, um, from the corporate, from the capital market point of view. The idea of this company is, you know, they are in the same category, you know, ADCs, you really want to make sure your half-life is long, you're around the curve is good. So you have like, you know, pretty good portion of your stuff, get accumulated in tumor bed, then you use a uh, active target and deliver there. And the other uh, train of thought is like, uh, how about make it really small? So actually you can penetrate the tumor better because the tumor is supposed to be really dense. And that's another uh, train of thought. Alpha, beta 3, I believe is highly expressed first of all by angiogenetic um, blood vessel, which is uh, you know kind of a pretty abundant uh, in tumor and they're probably also uh, expressed by some tumor cells or like uh, fibroblast cells, I don't know. Virage, you probably know better. So that's a general idea. This is one of uh, those uh, uh, example in this case, uh, a similar company also including like a bicycle. So this one, you know, they show their data and the data people really didn't like it. So if you look at them over there, uh, first of all, patient number is really small and uh, their response is uh, pretty uh, underwhelming, I would say. And then if you look at their duration of response, which is a chart on the upper right, uh, also not that great. And the probably can also argue their uh, follow-up time is not very long, but in, if you look at those uh, patients who did uh, uh, respond uh, or stable disease, they get a progression pretty quickly. So it turned out the market really didn't like it. The market like voted down. Actually, before uh, the catalyst uh, drive them down probably like you know 70%. They lost 70% market cap. Uh, I didn't show the full picture. Before that, they were just like $1, and they pumped up because people had a lot of hope about this one and just went back to their, where they were. Uh, so, you know, they have a like, you know, quick, uh, how to say, um, a, a revival, but they just went back to a little bit distress, uh, distress uh, situation again. So that's all the basic facts I can say. Jeff, you saw this many times, tell us what lesson we can learn from cases like this. Well, I think there's all sorts of lessons for, for everyone. One, I, I think, uh, you know, to, for, I mean, I know it's part of the uh, system, but for playing this game uh, around the stock for a phase one <laughs> is, is frankly, in my opinion, a, a little silly. But, um, you know, I think one thing's interesting is when you look at the data and this, you know, these are small numbers and it's immature and, you know, they're still doing their, um, uh, you know, dosing. But, you know, I've seen some people kind of questioning, oh, maybe, you know, they've kind of not, they've seen, and of course, you know, Vinzarex put a, you know, said this was promising data, and, and it may well be promising. Um, but I think some people have said, you know, well, it's it's not, you know, what we would have liked to see because they haven't reached, you know, their kind of highest doses. But frankly, when you look at this, you're, you're seeing responses that they're showing are more at the 0.6, not necessarily, you know, in fact, you have one colorectal there at the 0.8 that 
actually is, is not responding well. So it's not clear to me that it's a dosing effect. I think you alluded to it earlier. I think this is uh, the challenge here is is one of kind of half life and, and clearance. Um, and I think, you know, anyone working on macrocyclics or others, you know, needs to consider this. And even um, Mr. X has published themselves about, I think they did a, uh, some type of um, study where they looked at kind of some uh, bi specific, you know, dual targeting um, uh, of these small molecule drug conjugates. And it significantly. Uh, you know, increased half-life and reduced clearance. So I think this is more just a, a function of this may just be not the optimal molecule, let alone whether, you know, they found the right dosing and dosing frequency. Um, and of course, you know, they are, it is a competitive space and, you know, it may be that the small molecules aren't the best, but there are also lots of other approaches that address some of the limitations that people claim for you know, standard ADCs, which is, you know, they can't penetrate well into certain tumors and tissues. And so there are people working on kind of nanobodies or or other things that kind of sit in between these two small molecules and classic standard ADCs. So that's what I wanted to add, but I'd be curious to hear what Lifa or, or Barrage or, or Cassian, you know, might want to add. No, I, I think, I mean, the I mean, the, the, I mean, it doesn't certainly fully validate their platform because, I mean, you know, I mean, like you said, I mean, there is one aspect of penetration, one aspect of safety. I mean, I did, they did say that there are no DLTs and, I mean, it looked fairly safe for the small number of patients that um, no treatment uh, discontinuations. I mean, typically, if you look at ADCs, I mean, eight, you know, ranging from 10 to 30 uh, percent, you know, in the clinic or in the real world, actually, you know, patients get discontinued, you know, have discontinuations. But I mean, I, I think that's another reason why I think, you know, you also see that huge reaction from the market is that, you know, I think there was some level of expectation of validating that platform for them, which didn't come through in, in, in this, at least early data. Maybe it will as they mature. Well, but, I mean, it's, it's arguable. Yeah. I mean, they have activity. Yeah. If, I mean, that depends yeah. how you define, you know, demo, you know, it's not true POC, but you know, yeah. it clearly does something, um, you know, does something. the ultimate version of what they could do or what any type of small molecule conjugate could do, you know, yeah. that's a lot of burden on this, uh, this yeah. agent. <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on. So quick uh, scorecard check. So I was wrong, this one, this one should be probably okay. This one should be really good, right? So I changed that. That's what you say. That's a, you can correct me. Continue, please. I am fifty percent right. First part. <laughs> so I'm as good as a, as a, like a flipping a coin, actually. Great. <laughs> All right. So this part I do real quick. Uh, again, I would go um, uh, this stuff. Uh, basic facts. This is uh, something. Uh, Mark presented. This is the asset in license from Kowloon. That's uh, one of the biggest uh, in license deal they did with the China Biotech. Uh, they presented data, and uh, you know, uh, if you don't know this one, this uh, you know, I believe the DAR is eight, and the, their uh, payload is a uh, 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 top one uh, inhibitor. So very classic, right? I guess that's uh, everyone's like a looks either identical or strongly uh, similar to uh, Daiichi's <laughs> DS8201 uh, platform. This is one is no exception. Uh, I, and uh, once you have that, uh, this is um, you know, this part of their, uh, I would say, uh, signal funding trial. This is uh, their fourth cohort, which focus on gastric um, cancer. This is probably, now you say, why had this uh, idea? Why not a more combined PD-1 and uh, P uh, ADC? Because I have both. So if you look at their monotherapy data, in my opinion, looks pretty decent. That definitely uh, convinced them. There's something they can probably open a pivotal trial. Uh, everything just like Merck standard, right? Pretty uh, robust. So you can definitely trust their data. And the ORR, if you can see it, it's a, I don't know uh, the historical number on top of my head, but I think uh, there's some signal. And uh, especially for patient only have a, a two line, uh, there's like almost a 30%. I think uh, quick like a rule of thumb, I think that's probably some something you can start thinking, but definitely not like a blockbuster. Definitely this is not as good as a, uh, in HER2 early days, right? When they did like, you know, like last line, uh, HER2 positive or HER2 like a low breast cancer patient is way about higher than this. So I think that the initial signals are pretty promising. 
But uh, what uh, uh, we're going to do with this in gastric cancer, uh, uh, I don't recall, to be honest with you. Probably the guy already said, uh, I just didn't remember. I'll stop right here. I'll let uh, you guys uh, chime in. That's fresh data, but you guys are experts. So what, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, I just high level, I think it's lukewarm. I mean, I think there's definitely activity, but typically all, all the ADCs have some oral therapy activity because, you know what I mean? It is targeted and, you know, it is, uh, it's got a you know reasonable payload that has been validated. But I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, the third line I think is probably more interesting. I think because, I mean, I mean, also because I think it, they did say that, uh, you know, unlike other ADCs, uh, this had no ILDs. Uh, so probably could be slightly safer. I think that's probably going to be key in the later line settings. Uh, so, but I mean, if you look at second line historical data, I mean, it's very comparable to RAM Daxo right now. Probably, you know, 25, 30% response rate and PFS of, I think, four or five months. So I think that's what they're seeing. So I, I don't think it's, I mean, it's like you said, it's not striking enough. I mean, I don't think it's, it's but yeah, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, evidence of activity. So, I mean, they have to probably think about more optimized setting you know where they want to develop it some kind of combination trials that are probably thinking about so but yeah overall yeah i mean i i would say there is activity but not i wouldn't be like oh my god this is insane and we want to you know no evidence no evidence of it shining in the competitive yeah space. yeah and there's lots of trope twos as well so i think a sassy is also doing some of this and other trope twos are also doing exploring other indications of course beyond breast and you know bladder so so it's not it's not like a you know huge white space as well. There is lots of lots of other ADCs that are looking at this uh, trope twos as well. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I also remember when they initiated phase three study, they didn't initiate on this one. Initiate non small cell lung cancer. Probably that's also tell you internal their priority, right? Just mm -hmm. look at where they put their money, put their resources. Probably this is not definitely not like in the top three or something. Let's say I could be wrong. Probably tomorrow, Nance they initiate a pivotal phase three with this assay. <laughs> Who knows? But probably if they do pembro plus this one in gastric cancer, I'll be so happy. That means I'm smart. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, let's uh, move this one. Uh, okay, so this one's really like a collection of a three ADC. Uh, this all preclinical data. I'm gonna go through them real quick. I like the first two. Why is that? Very simple. I already highlighted they are effective to passive resistant tumor. I think that's a white space. The passive is a sign of care for bladder cancer. The first one, let's just uh, don't jump the line. First is uh, from Daiichi. Daiichi just do this and then I you know, change the target in my in my opinion. Let's, let's just look like you know in her too, but a different antibody. And it worked. You know, if you I really want to bring your attention to this chart. So that's where I really get my attention. This one. Ooh, yeah, this one. So what they did, you say they very smartly. Um, they kind of you know particular find those uh, you know um, uh, uh, experiment where they didn't respond to the passive, which is standard care in this model, that well, and switch them to their drug. And you say they responded, right? That really kind of mimic it, like you know refractory relapse situation. That's their. That's what they did over there. And this, uh, so, uh, like I said, this is pretty much like a uh, uh, infer to but with a different target, right? In this case, that this is called like a uh, mark one. I believe that's the kind of a popular target uh, in gastric cancer. That's the first uh, abstract. This is from Daiichi. The second one from Inenda Pharma. Uh, you know, again, the Daiichi platform really popular. This one's also very similar. You say also like a uh, topo one inhibitor uh, payload. And in this case, they also did another type of uh, experiment prove the same idea, they're going to be uh, effective, could be, to the passive resistant. So in this case, I think they're just like, you know, tumor model, they intentionally grow uh, the tumor, um, this type of tumor, which are uh, resistant to passive. By the way, they're like academic is a uh, uh, infotumab, uh, Redotin, that's why they call it EV. And the, the same thing, they had a sound signal over there. I think they go both going after the same market, Actually, over there, they already have one success story, which is called, uh, uh, what's this, Cobas Pharma. They they did this. Uh, they are going after the passive uh, uh, market, but uh, in that case, they just have an ADC, which is less toxic, based on what they said. And uh, they raised quite a bit of money this year, I think $120 million, I think in this February. 
So I think this is like a passive, you know, because they create a, such a big mar market and passive is not perfect. There's a lot of, uh, you know, room for, for you to improve. I think that's uh, all those like this generation, this including this two, are really going after. So this one, I really like this, my personal opinion. And the third one, I have a little bit, uh, you know, kind of a doubt. So in this case, uh, they are her two, one of the many her two out of China, ADC. And that's the design. I'm not a chemist. I really cannot comment, but just based on the DAR, I don't think they use a kind of a, you know, system-based uh, conjugation because the DAR is, uh, you know, not really a full number, right? Must be kind of a, you know, uh, the homogeneity of uh, the DAR property is not that good. I could be wrong. Please correct me, the chemist in the audience. And really, this part got me a little bit um, confused why they are doing what they are doing. So you say what they did here, uh, they try to compare themselves uh, with the uh, 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 inherto, which is a DS8201. And uh, the only way they could have a similar efficacy with the inherto is uh, they combine their ADS and the chemo. So that's really turned me off. It's like, you know, then, you know, you could do this, you heard to, could also do this, right? Would, would you be better than that? So that's where I found like a, not a very convincing, but this as already in phase two, in clinical trial phase two, but I feel gonna be a little bit difficult for this one, at least in the uh, global market to really have a, a place. That's all I have to say. Please everyone chime in. There's a three abstract together. They all present in the same session, by the way. I, I just want to make a comment from one of the questions. And um, were patients selected on the basis of the antigen target expression? Um, because uh, someone noted that the previous uh, study did not uh, stratify to TROP D2. Um, so I'm not sure if the companion diagnostic is relevant with ADC. That's a very good point. Uh, uh, I don't re recall precisely, but I, I think this uh, question, the, 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 the audience will be right. Uh, that who didn't use a TROP2 as a you know, biomarker, because that's why I recall most ADC don't use a biomarker except for po probably in, in La here, you know, the uh, follow mm -hmm. receiver alpha, they did go after follow receiver or receiver alpha high. I mean, even in HER2, right, turned out uh, even in HER2 negative. Uh, her to negative, they have some signal. It's crazy. I, I never truly understand. Yeah, IAC may not be the most sensitive. You may require a, a different assay um, if you really want to use it uh, to to uh, as a as a criteria. So, any comments to 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 prove I was horribly wrong? Otherwise, we're gonna move on because I have so many. <laughs> I was just going to have one high level comment that the sequencing of ADCs, you know, with more and more, you know, more than 10 approved across indications is, is becoming a very, you know, important thing, right, you know, and I think one aspect that comes to mind is, you know, resistance to certain payloads, right, you know, topo one resistance is known, I mean, you know, you typically, if you see topo one ADCs after topo one ADCs, they don't tend to work, but that's, of course, as MMAE payload, so in this, I think both these ADCs are having, you know, like you said, Leon, have topo one, so I, I think there is, you know, now going to be an optimization of, you know, payload, uh, you know, kind of selection and, you know, what you can use after certain ADCs, some of those aspects, you know, can you address resistance mechanisms to 2.1 ADCs with, let's say, another payload. And and I think another aspect is, as, as you know, people develop ADCs, as you know, as you can see, I mean, you know, with the same payloads, you're seeing very different responses uh, in certain tumors versus other tumors, right? Oh, so, so I think that aspect of optimizing, you know, which payload is going to be more, you know, kind of effective or, you know, let's say there are certain indications that are topo sensitive historically or, or with the ADCs. And that's where you kind of optimize your, your you know, topo one ADC, uh, you know, development is definitely something that's all happening, you know, uh, con competently with, you know, of course, finding new uh, targets, you know, like, I mean, like this, and I think Mach 1 is unique, but of course, Nectin 4 is approved. So, uh, so, and, you know, you have, a, you know, more than, I think, 75 per two targeted agents as follow-ons with different linkers and different payloads. So definitely something that that uh, is, is going to be important, not just for new ADCs, I mean, you know, just newer white space, but the whole sequencing of ADCs. Uh, Jeff, uh, you're mute. Yeah, yeah maybe Sorry about that. that comment regarding the, the payload, maybe because I came from precision oncology background. Uh -huh. So there was an interesting presentation from MGH that for patients who receive the, um, HER2 ADC by using topo, topo inhibitor as the payload, 
we started to see resistant mutations. So that's another thing probably to pay attention as ADC being more and more broadly adopted. Yeah, I was going to add, I think, you know, you need to think about the, you know, the effects of the target, right? Whether it's shedding, splice variants, uh, down regulation, et cetera, and then the resistance to the, the payload you have to think about. But even beyond that, I mean, there's there's much more complexity than people often realize. I remember uh, having some discussions and seeing early data from a lot of the work that Ambrix had done and just showing how, you know, just not just varying by DAR, but varying where in fact a given payload was put on the antibody changed the effectiveness and the effects that that antibody would have uh, on the same targets. So, um, so there's clearly a lot of interesting interactions and that may even apply to, you know, resistance mechanism, maybe resistance isn't absolutely inherent. Uh, so you might be able to, to retreat a patient who kind of progressed on you know, PADSEV or something else with us, us uh, you know, kind of a similar payload if it's somehow doing something different. Again, I'm just kind of speculating here based on that old data. But, you know, I know we have at least one true <laughs> ADC expert uh, I see signed on. So I don't know that I've necessarily ever been in a session where we call out an attendee, but I don't know if Bill Boyle wants to uh, to weigh in at all uh, by typing in anything into the chat or, or Q&A, but feel free, Bill, because I just noticed that you were signed on. Anyway. All right, while we are waiting, I know like Casey, I actually have to go. I can you know, uh, jump the order, go to the app so I can really want to uh, cover. So let's uh, go, go to that one directly and uh, please go. This is a fascinating please. lecture by, by Viva Jeff, um, uh, who's now um, running uh, at least this show at Genentech. Um, and I think we've always wondered what is the point of this cell atlas and how does it lead to um, sort of transformative medicine? Um, <clears throat> I'm not going through this in in detail um, because I want to get to the major point here, which is that <clears throat> she's able to, um, and, and you look at the numbers here that um, if you're trying to make a cancer cell atlas, you're dealing with very, very large numbers, especially when you start looking at the number of driving mutations and variant combinations and so forth. Um, but, the the major um, goal of this was to if you could take an existing um, data set um, in this case H and E stains for example and you can divide from that um, the RNA seq or single cell RNA seq data um, you now don't have to go back and you know redo all those samples collect samples run the RNA seq and because of the um, vast numbers of samples and the AI generative power that's available. Uh, this is exactly what she's been able to do. If you look at the upper right hand corner, um, is like a as using encoding decoding technology, which I'm not going to explain to you because I only scratch the surface of this. But this is technology that um, allows you, in fact, to read a stain and then um, uh, deconvolute um, a U map um, such as you see there into multiple cell populations. It, it is really quite amazing technology. And what is the 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 point of doing all this? When you look at responders and non-responders, for example, to um, PD-1 therapy, it turns out um, that there are two major programs that were initially apparent. The first was um, CD4 or CD6 um, uh, cyclin-dependent kinase activity. And so the reason that was picked out initially, because there are inhibitors available. So she only searched for those in which there was an actionable drug. And it turns out this was a major predictor um, of whether... Um, patients um, have responded or not to PD-1 therapy, so level of CD4, uh, CDK4-6. Um, when she looked deeper and looked at the programming and the pathways of all this, it turns out JAK-STAT was a major, uh, again, uh, um, immune resistance pathway. And then um, when you just expanded that to everything, which was uh, whether it was actionable or not, um, had um, literally hundreds of possible targets. Um, and then to analyze that in terms of, you know, true, true, uh, but related, um, apply the technique known as perturb-seq, uh, which involves CRISPR and also um, trying to change one or two of those genes and see what the outcome is um, through iterative uh, pressures. Um, that's already being done, but to do it to this massive sample and then to apply on top of that uh, a protein layer with site perturb-seq, which she calls, um, you now have enormous power at your disposal to identify uh, possible uh, resistance pathways, those chemoimmune resistance. 
Um, I think, you know, this power can also now be applied to um, neoangiogen vaccine selection of epitopes, selection of targets. Um, we didn't see a whole lot of real data there, um, but obviously they're working hard on that. And then finally, the one thing which may be of interest to all the antibody aficionados here is to, to use the same sort of encoding decoding technology and run generative AI. And it, it was mind boggling to actually see an antibody being made almost in real time, a construct uh, to a particular target using the power of this technology. So I, I think, you know, we we really um, at first wonder what is the use of this? Certainly for academic reasons, enormous use, but that the power of this to generate actual products now, not just um, to predict uh, responses is, is uh, uh, was most impressive to me, uh, not even being a, a, a bioinformatics guy. Wow, that's a fantastic summary. When I look at all those complicated charts, I just uh, zoom out because for me, it's too, too many errors. <laughs> just to be honest with you. For me, Kaplan curve, uh, that's, uh, that's something I could understand. Well, now that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so I heard there's a lot of uh, hype, a lot of uh, kind of uh, you know uh, enthusiasm about AI. Now you kind of tie everything together, feel like this is something solid. It's just my, you know, by, based on what I heard from you. Others, please comment because right now AI is so huge in our industry. Yeah, uh, maybe I can comment a little. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Casey. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Liwan. Yeah, yeah I, I would just I was not specific about uh, Avi's presentation. Obviously, there's two presentations, right, in the plenary session on the AI side. So follow Avi, I think, is um, Jason, uh, Jacob Nicholas uh, Cursor's presentation on using AI for mostly pathology H and E slides. I think the probably a couple of lessons we can think about it beyond just disregard AI as a hype. One, I think it is, seems to be the case that imaging might be the universal language to really train the AI model because all the other measurements we historically like to use are very um, situational. So it's very hard to really aggregate the data and also it tends to be more of a aggregated measurement, right? If you think of IHC score, right? One, two, three. You reduce a single slice to a single number, which really doesn't represent the heterogeneity and all the detail there. So I think that's something really worthwhile to pay attention, how much imaging data being so faithful, so high resolution can be used more universally compared to all the other situational markers we tend to measure biological readout. The other one, I think there was a session on the kind of post-TCG era where how you're going to use precision medicine, even though that one wasn't specifically commenting on AI or imaging. But I think the message there again is we're moving beyond just saying a patient is HER2 or positive or, or you know, KRAS mutation positive in this kind of aggregated view, right? The message there is that you need to understand whether they are clonal, right? You need to understand whether there are other co occurring events, again, going beyond this the aggregated level to more detailed level to more situational using whether you're using a kind of small molecule like KRAS, mutation, KRAS inhibitor to really driving the clonal pathway total inhibition, or you have to do combo, or you may have to go to ADC if you're not, uh, like in her two cases, you're not clonal. So I think it's basically all of this is pointing us, we have to go much more higher resolution. and. From that point of view, whether we believe AI is the ultimate solution or not, I think the complexity means we need additional help beyond traditionally how we you know, practice medicine. I think it's important to go higher resolution to think about how we get going to use, whether we call that AI or not, use this kind of a sophisticated tool to help us to really manage higher resolution information to give patients much more sophisticated treatment options. I was only going to say that if you guys have time, you really, really should look at her lecture. I mean, there's so much in each slide information and going from uh, she was even able to pull all this uh, in aggregate and then deconvolute in single cells. So, I mean, what you're saying, Lee, is, is is extremely important, extremely important as we get more and more data We're talking about, you know, meta metabytes or petabytes of data that are coming through, especially with images and to be able to handle that certainly was not feasible before, or even to transfer from, from one institution to another. And I think the right. transfer exactly. information is, is actually going to be the limitation here. It's not actually the, you know, the ability to, to deconvolute it. Now, how do you get that from one 
one individual center to another. Right. In the in the lecture I was referring to in that kind of a post-CCG era, that uh, the, the presentation from Dana Faber asking exactly the question instead of asking the pathology reporting whether it's a IHC score one, two, three for her too, they asked to actually see the slides to really know whether it's a multi it's a subclonal or clonal, right? So I think again, how do patient how do we as a human being comprehend those information systematically? which you actually really need this kind of machine learning AI tool to help you. Wow, thank you for your comments. That's uh, now I have to go back and watch the whole thing. But also that make convince me like Nvidia stock probably have a, another leg to go. <laughs> if they really convince people healthcare, you know, right? Think about it, how many like a GPU we have to buy, how many data center, just kidding, right? I don't own Nvidia stock at all. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's go back to that. So, Christian, if you have to leave, please leave. I know you are very busy. Thank you for uh, joining us. I share a lot of insights. Really, really appreciate that. Let's just go back to where we were, and that's uh, where we are. Let's continue our ADC. Let's go back to something uh, much, much like, you know, kind of a, a tangible. Uh, uh, so, this is another ADC. This ADC is really about a new target. That's why get picked. I actually get highlighted by quite a few um, uh, reports and the journalists. This is from Hamburg, this is from German. So it's not like it is totally just been dominated by Asian, uh, you know, kind of about the companies. There's still some other players. So what they did here, you know, I would say kind of a classic. Now what they're doing here is nothing really dramatic, but they just show you there's other targets in addition to her two top two, you know, <laughs> Mark one. There's this other target, not not as crowded, and the initial data looks legit. Lo looks like you know, uh, justify for some clinical you know uh, evaluation. That's what I what I can say. You know, everything's pretty much uh, very standard, right? Show you how to like, conjugate the whole thing, and they also have a new type of payload, new target, new payload. I think that's kind of interesting. I could be could be not really new if you are very knowledgeable, and I'm not aware of this. And the data looks uh, pretty uh, encouraging, right? They totally kind of uh, regress tumor growth. I think that's uh, pretty much uh, everyone really want to look at. Instead of uh, like, you know, inhibit a tumor, uh, like slow down tumor growth, they really want to, you know, shrink the tumor instead of uh, slow down the tumor. So they did definitely show that. And uh, when they show this in the PDX model, looks good, but not, you know, kind of slam dunk, right? Because of the tumor grow back later on. I'm talking about efficacy in colon cancer PDX model, uh, you know, but they are so so new. I don't know whether they have used the, the optimal dose, whether the models are really representative, I don't know. So I'll stop right there. You know, the data is in front of you. Uh, tell me what you think. Let's just clarify one thing for me though. So this is the, this is not one of their, um, Amantin, or it is one of the Amantin labeled ADCs. It's right? Amantin. Amantin. It is. Okay. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Taking a destroying angel <laughs> poison and, and putting it as a, as a payload. I know there have been some publications of some issues historically that, that they showed with uh, liver toxicity due to uh, binding. And I think this is a next gen um, form of their molecules that they have that are, you know, FC. Uh, you know, altered so they don't bind to the uh, the receptors. Um, but um, but it is promising. And it's always nice to have, uh, you know, kind of those new payloads going back to the previous conversation about, you know, kind of the resistance mechanisms between the target and the payload. So. I think GCC is an interesting target as well. I mean, I think there is some QRT data um, that came out in ACR this year as well with GCC uh, based CAR T's in, in solid tumors. So again, I think it's very early, but you know, I mean, GCC definitely have been validated in CRC and I think other GIs, I think pancreatic, uh, others, I think the ESFHO also has, I think a large fraction of patients that have GCC overexpression. So um, yeah, definitely interesting data and evolving, you know, target in, in not just ADCs, but different modalities like CAR T's and other, other, others as well. Yeah, because I've got a novel payload, and kind of a novel mm -hmm. uh, a, approach with their with their antibodies, uh, a couple other kind of novel aspects of their their platform. So, interesting. Not really been so much yeah. on my radar screen before Heidelberg. So, yeah, I wish them best luck. If this works, you know you, they can expect another twenty uh, ADC funds a, a, a particular country in half a year. Ha. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. So what's next? Uh, actually, we have to speed up a little bit. So I'm going to put uh, my kind of analyst hat a little bit uh, geared towards that. This is uh, the radio pharmaceutical. The reason I picked this one, because the company was acquired. <laughs> so we really want to know why the company was acquired. So they showed the data from their data assay, which is a pretty much a Plovicto change uh, the radio isotype. Plovicto is a lutein 177, the sagatinian 255. Right, this is a classic. Uh, 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 how you call that? Be better. <laughs> this is a be better. Uh, you know, radio pharmaceutical, right? So, um, I mean, the, the data looks uh, pretty legit. And um, again, I uh, I I haven't dived into this for a long time. Looks like comparable, at least in this uh, kind of model. And the most important part, I think, is I think probably that's the reason why this assay shows so much value. Uh, highlighted here. Is uh, you know some Provicto treated the patient. That means they already relapsed to Provicto responded to this one. I think this is uh, like a logic very similar to different payload of uh, ADC, right? One payload doesn't kill you, the other one probably gonna kill you. I, I uh, you know I I don't understand. I don't know the detail. What's the killing mechanism between you know alpha and the beta particle? But uh, you know in this case the target everything. The ligands are very similar, but they, you know, the uh, uh, radionucleotide is a little bit different somehow they work in some patients, you know, especially if you see here in the, in the green bar, the uh, lutein 177 PSMA treated, which is a Lovicto treated patient, some of them responded. I think probably that's the reason why they get acquired. Thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, I, I agree. I mean, that's, that's I think, the value prop here. I mean, I think they're showing the Victor uh, experience patients responding to this uh, HFN. I mean, I, there's definitely increasing deal making in, in the radio pharmaceutical space. You know, you saw Eli Lilly, uh, I think AC just uh, bought Fusion. Uh, mm -hmm. BMS uh, had another deal in December last year. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, you, know, I, uh, you know, especially yeah. heightened after Provicto is. Uh, approval or you know always been in the last five years but i think you know they see that now you are seeing you know these radio pharmaceuticals approved you know uh, used i mean of course Plovicto has its own set of you know you know you know you have to have you know infrastructure technical i mean it's not like you know a small private practice is going to be able to treat uh you know patient with Plovicto. they're probably going to refer them you know uh, to a larger practice or community center or a tertiary center for administration but you know i definitely you know increasing uh, interest in 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 the radio pharmaceutical. Yeah, it's so interesting that so many. I mean, it's kind of an adjacent parallel, you know, uh, hot area um, to a kind of standard cytotoxic ADCs and next gen ADCs, but they're not cytotoxics like uh, uh, degraders, etc. But it is interesting that so many kind of radiotherapies are in fact being applied to to prostate cancer, right? Starting with yeah. um, you know, Sofigo and, and of course now this Provecto and then this. So um, I think what's kind of was particularly interesting to me, not this necessarily alone, uh, but it was some of the data you shared with me, um, Barrage from uh, from AACR was just more people and interesting studies focusing on prostate cancer, which, you know, I think needs a, a lot more help to kind of get beyond where we're at, get beyond, I mean, the tremendous success of the androgen, uh, you know, uh, receptor blockers is, is great, but I thought that's that combination study with enzalutamide. So, you know, obviously, it's now combining two agents that Pfizer and Enzalutamide's partner with Astellas, of course. But you know that that part that they got from the Biomarin acquisition way back when, Telazoparide combined with Enzalutamide, that looked interesting. Um, and then, of course, AZ had their next gen PARP inhibitor too, which doesn't look any worse in terms of efficacy and may have a better safety profile. So. Yeah, so I want to give uh, everyone time check because uh, we're really into this. We run behind the time. We may run late. Uh, I want to make sure everyone's okay. Or we just have to cut the Q and A really short. I need to leave on time. Yeah, okay. we totally so all do. Yes. Okay. So real quick. Um, so this one just like you know, give you like highlight. Uh, you know, the abstract from out of China is really. Uh, jumping up a lot, they gave a little bit idea. I want to give a little bit shout out to a few companies here, right? Like uh, Jiangsu Henry, uh, Henry, right? They have a lot of abstract, followed by Innoven. There's a new new kids in town, Villa Vigo. They can have a two late break uh, abstract, uh, pretty good as a first time, uh, pre uh, you know, company presenting on the ACR. You can look them up. They have a two by specific ADC. 
And there's a lot of a PD-1. Right now, China's really dominant PD-1. And actually talking about the buy specific ADC, if you believe that's next generation, and there are a lot of a China uh, derived uh, ADC over there. There's a 13 buy specific ADC abstract from China. So I think, Leo, maybe I can complement uh, what you had a little bit. I think you have a heavy biologic focus. So I paid a bit of attention to the more on the small molecule side, the representation, right, from the China biotech. I think it's very clear in the small molecule hot target area, once the feasibility is being breakthrough, there tend to be a lot of new China company coming in very quickly. So I noticed for this year, for example, there are probably six or seven G12D abstracts from Chinese companies. Three of them actually brand penetrant. So I think that's definitely an area Chinese company going after very quickly, uh, including I think clearly a lot of TKIs with the focus on brand penetrant of multiple TKI inhibitors. The other thing I actually want to give shout out to two companies, they probably not as hot as what you put it here on the small molecule side. There are two companies working on P53 on Y220C um, mutations. I think the P53 has been notoriously difficult. So I'm really glad to see company working on them. So I think the, the small molecule side innovation, we shouldn't ignore them. You didn't see as a big deal, maybe as ADCs, but we do see two CDK2 deals recently, right? From Aileron and from the- Yes, answer. yes, yes. Yeah. I totally yeah. agree with you. Uh, not because I didn't say it, because just I'm too ignorant. I just don't understand it. <laughs> I think <laughs> the biologic <laughs> is hot, but let's don't ignore this, the old face for small molecules. No, no, well, I'm think. glad you brought up small molecules, whether they're from China <laughs> or otherwise, because one of the things I think I wanted to highlight, and I'd love to hear some of Viraj's thoughts, was kind of the next gen. Uh, you know, RAS inhibitors, and not just the specific ones by, like RevMet, which has been following for a while, and, and their study with, um, you know, their program, which is is kind of pan, a pan RAS, you know, targeting RAS on, which I thought was has been an, an, a really interesting program and continues to generate data, and given how significant a component RAS is across a range of cancers, um, you know, quite promising. Yeah, totally, totally agree. So let me just, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Let me just uh, uh, how's the, uh, uh, how's rush through this one and get into small molecule. Last part is all about small molecule. I just you know want to highlight a few you know uh, abstract from those bi specific. We are talking about this. The reason I picked this one profound. Uh, you guys probably already uh, recall. You know the company was acquired and during the earning call, Jim Map specifically said, "Look up, to, look at the, the data to be presented at ACR about their bi specific." So that's why I have this. Looks pretty good, I have to say. Have to say. You know, I highlighted a few of them. Uh, 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 what's going on? So the first one, if you look at the molecule, again, the very similar, you know, right now, uh, like a topo one is really the kids of the time, the, the discussion of the time. It's a different version of it. And that's number one. Number two, this team really know how to make their molecule hydrophilic. So if you look at their blood half-life, uh, you know, I listened to the talk that says more than 10 days. I'm pretty impressed. You know, ADC have more than 10 days, a blood half-life, right? Because I remember, um, you know, TDM1 is less than three days or, or around three days. This is like a three times longer. And this is a bi-specific, by the way, right? Yeah. That, that's a pretty impressive. And, uh, you know, this is preclinical data, right? Obviously, they have a little bit, of, you know, Noel. This is something I'm really, really careful, uh, uh, curious about, right? That's really tell you a lot uh, about their off-target uh, uh, toxicity. Uh, typically caused by the you know uh, dissociated payload that looks pretty good legit uh, I, I'm not sure this is uh, already the max probably they can even go higher so that's why I think uh, you know when GMAP said they really like uh, profound a platform this is probably a piece of evidence that the platform does generate a pretty decent molecule I mean in this case uh, and also the targets are validated right you we have this uh, naked uh, by specific already approved upon JNJ so this is kind of a be, I, I call the strategy drifting, right? You know the targets are pretty validated. You know the MOA, somehow you make it better. And then, you know, uh, people, you know, scientists probably think it's incremental, but uh, for drug developer, this is, uh, you know, probably have a better ROI return of investment because the risk is uh, much more controlled. Given all, is, uh, I, close, yeah. I was just going to say, given the close relationship that GenMap has had with Jensen J&J, &J, it'd be interesting to see if, you know, this gets partnered as the next gen to... to J&J's, &J, uh, you know. There you go. I oh, we already have a plan in the back pocket. So once we get there, hey, J&J, &J, do you want this? Co like a core development, a core commercialization. Here we go. 
just like you know, same 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 playbook, a little bit different uh, uh, storyline, right? Yep. <laughs> Make a lot of sense. All right, so that's all we have with the biology. Let's dive into, uh, before that, I want to make sure, it looks like I'm pretty right, right? With the second and third bucket, you know, you 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 you, you don't disagree with me. The first one, I know I messed up. But anyway, so uh, let's get into the last one. We already did oh, this. Good. I didn't mess up. <laughs> yeah. Barash, here we go. So I know I couldn't find the poster. Probably you can quickly comment on the Li Hua. What's going on with the uh, uh, QRAS? This one also get highlighted by a lot of journalists. Yeah, I, I think I, I mean, I, I went through some of the preclinical data that they have. I mean, I mean of course, there, you know, the, the fact that we are, you know, RevMed, of course, is going broad QRAS, uh, but, you know, we are, you know, we have adagrasib and Sororasib that are only focusing on G12Cs, but of course, you know, that that's probably relevant in non-small cell. But if you look at CRC, the, the, the major, uh, you know, KRAS mutation is not G12C, it's actually G12B and G12B uh, that, that kind of forms the majority of the G, you know, the, the G12 mutation. So um, I, I think this is, you know, there is, of course, a slew. And it's not only these inhibitors. I mean, these, these selective inhibitors definitely are going to play a role in the smaller populations. But I'm envisioning that potentially, you know, you have KRA, a slew of KRAS degraders that are uh, you know, you know, there's, uh, I think, companies like Biotherics that are doing, you know, KRAS degraders are going to be broader. Rev RevMed, of course, is doing broader KRAS, both not just for mutant, but also wild type uh, KRAS, right? So it's, it's you know, yep. it's, you know, with and potentially showing data that has, it's, I mean, you know, historically, you thought that if you're targeting both mutant and wild type, you know, uh, you know it's going to be really toxic, but it does look like RevMed's agent is is fairly, you know, Okay, I mean, in terms of tox profile. So, I mean, I, I think there is definitely room for some of these, you know, and there's, you know, this data looks, you know, I mean, I think it looks interesting in that, you know, G12B, but I, I still feel like uh, it's going to be the broader, you know, rev meds or the degraders that are probably going to be much more, uh, you know, clinically relevant, relevant in the broader populations. And this is going to be probably that, you know, really niche populations that they can target with this. Yeah. And you know, exactly. the G12C, yeah, you see that the adagrasib is uh, being combined with Cetox, right? Adagrasib on its own didn't really have relevant data. You saw the phase three, they're going to push for, you know, the approval of adagrasib plus Cetuximab in second line CRC, you know, with that. So, so you know, you, you're, you know, in some of these, you know, small molecules are going to need that additional support. Where I, I, I think with the broader, you know, KRAS agents or the degraders, you're probably going to see that you know, more probably potential for monotherapies. So, yeah. And there sorry, was a concern, yeah. of course, that something like the PANRAS from RevMed, et cetera, would be, you know, more toxic than it appears to be. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think whether it's a degrader or whether their agent, you know, and, and it is pretty PANRAS, not only wild type, but G12X, 13F, you know, Q61, I mean, a whole range yeah. of um, yeah. RAS mutations. So, um, you know, keep our fingers crossed. It'd be great to have a uh, next-gen um, again, whether it's the RevMed or, or you know, one of the graders. All right. Next. How about this one? Anyone want to take this? I'm pretty ignorant about this. <laughs> yeah, I can maybe uh, quickly. I think without really going through the data, right? I mean, the reason people need the PARP1 specific inhibitor is because of the uh, the Olaparib, right, which have both PARP1 and 2 activity and I think the bone marrow talks are believed mostly coming from the two. So having a more you know isoform specific inhibitor is always desirable. And of course I think this particular molecule proof at this moment that's probably true. I think the if you listen to the discussion by Patricia LaRusso, she's basically asking the question is this really the emergence of the best in class molecule? And another thing she really commented about the de development of this particular molecule is how much is really um, kind of following the new guideline from FDA of the Project Optimus, you really, total, in totality, looking at all your preclinical and the clinical data to decide the best of those, which give you the best combination of the efficacy and the safety for the patient. So I think this is just a, overall a very beautiful story from both the set uh, characteristic of the molecule and the development and deciding what is the efficacious dose. And we already see there is probably I think maybe 11 or a multiple PARP1 specific inhibitors coming right behind it. Fantastic. So Li Hua, I have a question for you. Yep. Surely from a kind of a non-expert uh, perspective, 
how how do you think uh, the industry can adapt this like a uh, uh, you know this uh, optimus right so like fda strategy obviously this is is doing this uh would this uh, uh, something going to become like a mainstream and all the future drug developers and biotechs should think like this I also wouldn't claim I'm the expert, but I think that's clearly there. And you have to seriously consider that as part of your early clinical development, how to decide the dose rather than just MTD oriented. But I think probably a regulatory or clinical development expert should really comment on that. I see, got it. Very good. So any comments? If no, we're gonna move to the next one. Here we go. Yeah. Taking us down to the wire here, Leon. <laughs> Anyone, Virash? Please, yeah, I is, have no idea. I think, that, <laughs> I think this is that ATM inhibitor, right? By uh, which is I correct. Think, uh, radio correct. Radio sensitizers. I I think there is high met need, of course, in MGM beyond methylator. Why you know Temodar doesn't work that well. So there's a huge difference in you know prognosis for patients who are MGMT unmethylated, and of course you know adding this uh, plus the radiotherapy, you know. Uh, I mean, the data looks, in, I mean, I think it's interesting. And the fact that, you know, they're doing it uh, with, you know, uh, I think there's another DDR targeted agent as well that is looking at, you know, this combination with radiotherapy in uh, GBM to kind of being, you know, so so I think it's it's an interesting um, idea that, you know, you're you're using an, you know, DDR ATM inhibitor plus as a radio sensitizer to then, you know, uh, do radiotherapy in, in these also diabetes. cancer vaccines, right? The diaconos yeah. was in uh, unmethylated as well. Yeah. So yep. So there's uh, definitely a push in these these patient populations. And I think if you look, I I think there's data in even in recurrent GBM patients. So that again is an even higher bar because you know you're you're basically just getting chemo or retreated with, or basically uh, you know you're getting uh, the the device which is not really that great. I mean, most people don't. Do it. I forget the name. Uh, Optune, or I forget the name of the device, the the, the TTF, the tumor uh, field. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I I think it's an interesting uh, uh, initial data for for this agent as a radio, radio sensitizer to uh, in MG, uh, you know GBM. Any more comments? This is gonna gonna be our last data slide, and then we're gonna open to Q and A. That's a Q and A. Okay, so let's do Q and A. Uh, uh, sorry, Neva, I think we have probably please. before you go to Q and A. Maybe if I can add a comment of a few other again on more on the small molecule side, I think worth while mm -hmm. paying attention yeah. to one. I think is definitely the old targets, but I think looks like there's some really interesting new development. One is MDM two. I think we were interested in that target for a long time. And um, now there are two molecules actually being tested in cholangial carcinoma, seems to be showing interesting clinical efficacy. So I think it's worthwhile watching for that. The other I was really impressed is the AR degrader from BMS. I think, again, something to watch for. And the other area, I think this kind of so-called undruggable, I think people are still continue pushing from either small molecule or other modality on that front, right? So I think Ben Kravat had a plenary session discussion. He showed the data on the Fox A1, which is transcription factor. And there's a transcription factor section where kind of full disclosure, Greg Vadine, who's the CEO of my current company and my previous company, presented two transcription factors. And uh, Anelum actually bring their shRNA to a beta catenin mutant liver cancer. So that's mm -hmm. something to watch for. So I think that in this kind of more traditional oncogenome transcription factor, how people are still pushing the limit in that area, still worth, worthwhile watching for. Yeah, that's a good point about undruggable. We didn't talk so much about that, but there's Peptomic, which is going after Mick, and then you mentioned P53 earlier, talk about the expansion on RAS, um, and certainly going after transcription factors. Um, although it doesn't always work, it was disappointing to see, you know, uh, effectors uh, data. Um, you know, recently in long, but um, anyway. All right, fantastic. I, I guess you guys, if you have to leave, um, uh, please at least uh, we could do like one or two questions from the audience. Like I mentioned in the very beginning, uh, if you have any questions, please put in a QA. and a uh, And I look at this, actually, we cleared all of them. Uh, everyone, you know, while I'm busy talking, you guys are busy answering the question. 
So any uh, audience, please, and uh, now we open the floor for Q and A. If you have any question, please uh, raise raise your hand, or you can. Uh, speaker. Probably a couple of minutes before you late for your for your next meeting. Yeah, I saw Li Hua say only two minutes. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I have to go too. Any comments on Protex? Yeah, I mean lots of comments, but we really time. But I mean, I think it's a it's a great. I mean, not only you know, and there was what was the deal this morning, wasn't it? Was that Novartis with uh, Arvinus, I think, or or someone? So um, yeah, it's a great space. I particularly like uh, you know the greater AD, you know, as next gen ADC uh, payloads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the other I think maybe from a general trend watching for Protex point of view is what we can learn from ADC, right? Once the concept is there, you know, how much engineering will go into it to really fully. Um, unleash its potential. Protag is still a little bit early compared to ADC, right? But I think we really should watch for when the inflection point will be. Yeah, and it's a space that's exp expanding dramatically, right? So we use this term, you know, there are all sorts of degraders and glues that are now next-gen things, cellular yeah. targets and RNA, et cetera. So it's, it's really cool how the kind of the space is expanding Right. Because the concept well, is yeah, clear, no, no. right? It's about engineering to figure out the combination of the three. So there's yeah. a lot of room to do that. So Leon, maybe you have your next session. We talk specifically about the whole universe of uh, protax and glues and where they're all going mm -hmm. in terms of targeting different molecules. And BMS has, has been like after acquisition of uh, Celgene, they become like a leader in this space, right? And they have their next generation of uh, molecular glue. They had a deal with the Aura, which kind of put like a molecular glue type of stuff as a payload for ADC. Yep, right now, yep. you just have so many yeah, yeah. Lego pieces. You can make a lot of different things, right? You know, it's like a, the ADC just like become like a GPS, a guided delivery vehicle. You can deliver whatever you like or you well, believe. Yeah. Yep. I mean, cell gene should be expert in it since, you know, as they ultimately discovered, <laughs> Terrablon was the target of their image. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, looks like there's no more question. I'm very happy we actually finished on time. Thank you, uh, everyone, um, uh, to speak today. And also, just a shout out, if you really want to receive the re a replay of this uh, uh, video, please uh, subscribe to our mailing list that we're going to send this out once it's available. Otherwise, you have just uh, to wait until whenever we finish the other stuff, there's going to be a delay. And uh, with that being said, thank you, uh, Jeff. Thank you, Viraj. And also, leave out the left. The case is left, but thank you guys so much. Most important, thank all the audience around the world. I know actually quite a few texted me. They have different time zones. I, I thank you for your commitment. Hopefully, uh, this uh, the past uh, 90 minutes were like uh, worth your time. And I uh, hope uh, we all get smart. I, I certainly get smarter now. Uh, in this uh, space and uh, hope for all of us to get a little bit smarter and that going to be uh, the most uh, valuable stuff and encouraging stuff for us to do this again. Thank you all in your day and uh, have a good rest. Yep. Take Thank care. you, Leon. Thanks for joining Barrage. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.